Can a nation's past humiliation be forgotten? Some people decide to live a life of ease and comfort, while some choose to stick to their faith and fight to the death. In 1140, the 13th year after the fall of the Northern Song Dynasty, Yue Fei at the age of 38, suppressed his resentment and indignation and wrote this letter to Zhao Go, the emperor of the Southern Song Dynasty. Weichen观察 他们准备放弃辎重，逃回黄河以北。如今，天下豪杰与我军一心，各路人马舍命杀敌，可谓天时地利强弱分明。这样的大好机会势不再来，绝不能轻易放过呀，陛下。Yue had waited for this opportunity for as long as 13 years. In 1125, the Jin army stirred up the war. Two years later, Kaifeng, the capital of the Northern Song Dynasty, was conquered. Emperor Huizong of Song and his eldest son, Emperor Qin Song, were captured. 3,000 members of the Chao royal family and ministers, as well as over 100,000 refugees were taken to the far north by the Jin army. The population of the once prosperous and bustling Kaifeng plummeted from millions to tens of thousands. That year, Yue Fei was 24. His hometown, Tung In County in Henan, was badly damaged during the war. The sight of his shattered homeland and slaughtered countrymen kindled his desire for revenge and to restore the country. Chao Go, the ninth son of Emperor Huizong, survived and claimed the throne in what is today's Shangqiu, Hunan province. The Southern Song Dynasty had begun. Yue Fei, who came from a peasant family, joined Zhao Go and embarked on the road of service to his country. This was the first time Yue Fei wrote to Zhao Go at the age of 24. At this time, Yue Fei was only a junior officer and was not qualified to give advice to the emperor at all, so he was dismissed from the army for offending authority. But Yue Fei, who was dedicated to serving the country, never gave up. During the days of fighting against the Jin army, 
he wrote to the emperor again and again, expressing his incredibly firm resolution to recover the lost land. In 1130, the Jin army came south of the Yangtze River, determined to exterminate the southern Song dynasty. Yue Fei and the Yue army he assembled became the last line of defense. After a half a year of bitter fighting, the Yue army inflicted a heavy blow on the Jin army, and the Jin army retreated north of the river. Thus, the two armies stood arrayed against each other on both sides of the Yangtze River. Spared the suffering of war, those on the southern bank of the river were so grateful to Ue Fei that they worshipped his portrait in their homes, praying to it for safety. The recovery of Jian Kong, today's Nanjing, was a turning point. Yue Fei's northern expedition plan to recover the lost territory could finally start. During the first expedition, Yue Fei recaptured the six counties of Xianyang, and he was promoted to be the youngest military commissioner since the founding of the Song Dynasty. In the second expedition, he recovered a large area of territory south of the Yellow River in just a few months, a huge victory on a scale not witnessed in over a decade. But just as Yue Fei planned to follow up the victory and recover Hebei in one fell swoop, Zhao Go gave up. Yue Fei, who was at the front line, wrote a letter in a hurry to Zhao Ding, the Grand Chancellor. In fact, Zhao Go only needed Yue Fei when the enemy was at the gate. Qin Hui's proposition was more to Zhao Go's liking. Qin Hui suggested to Zhao Go the idea of drawing a boundary with the Jin dynasty to rule the north and the south respectively. In 1140, the Jin army marched south again. Yue Fei led the troops to intercept the enemy. The Yue army fought bravely with little thought for their own lives. The unstoppable heavy cavalry crushed the Jin army and reached the gates of Kaifeng. The morale of the Yue army was high, and Yue Fei, who was eager to strike the final blow, wrote this letter to the emperor. Yue Fei's memorial to the throne resulted in 12 urgent orders asking him to lead the troops back to the capital. Ten years of hard work went down the drain in one day. The soldiers who gave their lives for it all died in vain. The 
local people cried out and pleaded with the Ue army not to abandon them again. Ue Fei's pain and sorrow were beyond words. After returning to the capital, Ue Fei was arrested and thrown in prison. Shang 这就是微臣的平生夙愿 So it was that in the freezing winter of 1142, the hero who considered serving his country the mission of his life did not die on the battlefield, but died due to a trumped-up charge fabricated out of thin air. Ue Fei died unjustly, but his faith in serving his country lived on, inspiring generations of Chinese people to step forward in their country's time of need. Death was no stranger to 47-year-old Wen Tianxiang. His parents, wife, and son had all left him. The Southern Song Dynasty that he had devoted his life to also fell three years earlier, leaving him all alone in the vastness of the world. While everyone was waiting for him to surrender, he was waiting for death. The three men in Wen's family were all talented. Wen Tianxiang and his two brothers, Wen Bi and Wen Zhang, all passed the highest level of imperial examination. This letter was sent to Wen Huansheng, Wen Bi's son, who was later adopted by Wen Tianxiang. In 1256, Wen Tianxiang participated in the imperial examination. Emperor Li Zong of Song was more than excited when he saw Wen Tianxiang's essay and awarded him first rank. The emperor also gave him the name Song Rui, which means bringing prosperity and auspiciousness to the Song dynasty. In 1235, the UN army marched south, stirring up war between the Song and UN that would last for 40 years. Many officials of the Song dynasty suggested to the emperor to move the capital and flee south. Wen Tianxiang, was only a low-ranking official at the time, wrote to the emperor, angrily denouncing the treacherous sycophants and requesting the emperor appoint talents to turn the tide. 
the upright Wen Tianxiang thus offended the dignitaries. When he was almost 40, he was still just a governor of Ganzhou. In 1275, the UN army marched to the capital, Lin'an, and reached the gate of the city without encountering much resistance. The Song government panicked and many officials fled. The government conscripted troops, but not a single soldier came to reinforce them. The emperor's grandmother wrote an open letter scolding those traitors and defectors. When the nation was about to collapse, the Empress Dowager thought of Wen Tianxiang. Wen sold all his property to pay for the military expenses and mustered 30,000 men in just a few days. In this critical situation, he was appointed Grand Chancellor and Military Chief and became the mainstay of the Southern Song Dynasty. They fought against the Yuan army to their very last breath in Jiangsu and Zhejiang and were almost wiped out. Due to the great disparity in force, Lin An eventually fell. Wen Tianxiang retreated to Fujian and Guangdong and continued to resist. When Wen Tianxiang was 42, he lost his last son. His brother, Wen Bi, let him adopt his son, Wen Huanxiang. Wen Bi tried his best to support his brother and stayed in Huizhou in today's Guangdong province. Wen Tianxiang resisted for three years. The officials of the Southern Song, who had already defected, sent many letters asking him to surrender. These he rejected without hesitation. In 1278, 43-year-old Wen Tianxiang was captured in Wu Lingpo in Haifeng County in today's Guangdong province. In the following spring, the last forces of the Southern Song fought against the Yuan army in Mount Ya. In the aftermath of the naval battle of Mount Ya, the Southern Song dynasty finally came to an end. <laughs> Wen Tianxiang was imprisoned for four years. Kublai, the founding emperor of the Yuan dynasty, admired his loyalty and firm faith and sent the surrendered emperor of Song 
to try to persuade him to surrender. Wen rejected the overture. Kublai also personally tried to persuade him. Wen rejected this attempt as well. People didn't understand his attitude. As the Southern Song had already collapsed, what was he pledging his loyalty to? Li Ji said, when he was when Tian Xiong was true to his ideals and his faith never wavered. In the winter of 1282, he ushered in his long-awaited death Before his execution, he knelt in the direction of Lin An, the capital of the Southern Song Dynasty, and kowtowed to honor those warriors who sacrificed their lives and the righteousness that would never fade away. During the reign of Emperor Jia Jing, in the Ming Dynasty, Japanese pirates were rampant along the southeastern coast. Qi Ji Guang was the best known general who fought against them. Few know that one of his predecessors who didn't come from the military stepped forward when the country was in need and wrote his own heroic story. My <laughs> In 1554, Rin Huan, who was fighting against Japanese pirates in the front line in Tai Tung, in today's Jiangsu province, received a series of letters from his son. At the time he was seriously wounded in three places and his life was in danger. His son wrote to him, trying to persuade him to return home and recover. Wokoliudu,天下多少百姓不得安宁。为父如果不能灭尽沃口,就要像苏武一样,沃血灭战,同马原一样,马革国师。这个时候,你要我躲回苏州,和你们在家中抱头痛哭吗? Japanese pirates raided the coastlines of China and Korea from the 14th century to the 16th century. During the reign of Emperor Jia Jing, they became increasingly rampant, causing suffering to people in southeastern coastal areas. They burned down houses, robbed property, slaughtered civilians, and kidnapped women and children, bringing disaster to millions of people. The once prosperous and beautiful Suzhou area was reduced to ruins the then Ming army and was not an effective fighting force, so there was little the authorities could do in response. At this point, a name occurred to Shang Wei Chu, the governor of Suzhou, that of Ren Huan. <laughs> Ren Huan was from Changju in today's Shanxi province. He once served as the head of several counties and was known for his incorruptibility and competence. In 1551, 32-year-old Rin Huan was transferred to Suzhou to be an assistant to Shang Wei Chu, the governor of Suzhou. Shang Wei Chu knew that Ren Huan was a unique scholar. When he was young, Ren Huan studied martial arts and was good at swordsmanship and archery, rare accomplishments for scholars of his time. 
When the country was in trouble, Ren Huan was ordered to lead the troops to resist Japanese pirates. At the time, the Ming army's fear of Japanese pirates was spreading. Few soldiers dared to fight. So Ren Huan took drastic measures to get rid of incompetent commanders and soldiers of low combat ability. He mobilized 1,500 soldiers from Guangxi and formed a wolf troop, mainly cavalry, and recruited 6,000 infantries in Suzhou, giving them hand cannons and crossbows for training. According to the history of Ming, Rin Huan ate and slept together with the soldiers and shared their joys and sorrows. He distributed all the bounty he received from the imperial court to his men and did not keep a cent for himself. His men followed him willingly and carried out his orders without complaint. Before the battle to defend Suzhou, Ren Huan was the first to write his name on his body. He told his men that it was their duty to fight to the death on the battlefield and that a name written on the body would help people identify him. All the soldiers regarded this as their last stand. in 1553, Ren Huan fought a fierce battle with Japanese pirates in Shanghai. He led the charge and was the first to kill an enemy, thus raising the morale of the whole army. It was the first time that Japanese pirates saw such a Ming army and, immediately discouraged, they fled the field. Rin Huan led his troops to continue the pursuit and fought Japanese pirates at close quarters. It was in this battle that he was seriously wounded and almost killed. When his son got the news at home and wrote to ask him to go home to recuperate, he wrote this letter to bid farewell to his family. In 1558, the sixth year after he began campaigning against Japanese pirates, Ren Huan died of an old wound at the age of 40. At that time, the fight against Japanese pirates was in full swing in China. Ren Huan's brother and son followed Qi Ji Guang, Yu Da Yu, and other famous generals to continue his unfinished career. Ren Huan, a scholar, best exemplified the meaning of a great man. His life was just like the poem he wrote on the battlefield. I used to ride a horse through the mountains, and now I'm leading the troops to fight at sea. As long as I still have my sword and books, where can't I call it my home? In 1840, the first opium war broke out, and the destruction of opium at Hu Men was the excuse for the British to start the war. A man was in the eye of the storm, and his pain was deeper and more real than that experienced by any other Chinese person. This is a letter from Lin Zhe Shu to his two friends the year after the first opium war broke out. At the time, he was demoted and on his way to Xinjiang. He could no longer contain his indignation. In Lin Zhe Shu's time, the Western powers ran amok 
but the Qing dynasty rulers were still immersed in the illusion that China was invincible. At that time, the British Empire had just completed the Industrial Revolution and was in desperate need of overseas markets. The British found that the self-sufficient Qing dynasty did not need their goods, and in order to remedy this trade deficit, they turned to opium smuggling.鸦片还没有流行的时候，那些吸食者只是戕害自己，用棍棒来惩罚，还可抵罪。一旦鸦片流毒于天下，危害不堪设想，一定要从严治理。如果再不把它当回事，那么几十年后，我国就再没有御
At the beginning of the war, Lin Zuoshu was the commander of the front line. When defending Guangzhou, he sent people to Macau and Singapore to purchase foreign cannons, organize the translation of Western military works, and modify Chinese warships. He urged the Qing government that the warships and cannons were necessary for coastal defense and had to be planned for as early as possible. He believed that when China had a modern navy, it would be able to engage the British at sea and gain the initiative in the war. The British were unable to break through Lin Zuoshu's line of defense in Guangdong and had to drive their troops north. With the forbidden city in danger, the panicked Daoguang Emperor sent his ministers to negotiate peace with the British. To appease the anger of the British, Lin Zuoshu was dismissed from his post and sent to Xinjiang. Lin Zuoshu gave Wei Yuan geography of the four continents he wrote himself and entrusted Wei to write illustrated treatise on the maritime kingdoms which proposed to learn the advanced technologies from the Western powers to resist invasion by them. This was exactly what Lin Zuoshu advocated. It can be said that he was the first person in modern China to open his eyes to see the outside world. In his four years in Xinjiang, Lin Zuoshu traveled over 15,000 kilometers and built water conservancy projects to benefit the local people in all the places he had been to. He spent his life making a poem he had written a reality. I shall dedicate myself to the interests of the country in life and death, irrespective of personal weal and woe. Although he suffered a lot of hardship, his care for the country and the people never changed. On September 24, 2018, a sunken ship was discovered in waters near Da Lian, Liaoning province. Under 17 meters of water, the gilt characters Jing Yuan on the wood on the side of the hull tells the world that this is the warship Jing Yuan that sank during the 1894 Sino-Japanese War more than 100 years ago. The wreckage of the shells on the deck shows that the real war was far more brutal and cruel than recorded. This is the letter that Chen Jing Ying, the second mate of the cruiser Jing Yuan of the Beiyang fleet, wrote to his father in 1894. In 1880, Viceroy of Zhe Li and Beiyang Trade Minister Li Huangzhan founded Tianjin Naval Academy, also known as Beiyang Naval Academy. With a burning desire to serve the country, young Chen Jing Yin was admitted. The Qing government purchased four advanced warships from the Western powers, including the cruiser Jing Yuan. Li Huangzhan sent 400 elite Navy men to Europe to receive the warships and Chen Jing Yin was one of them. When the Beiyang fleet was built, 28-year-old Chen Jing Yin was promoted to the second mate 
of Jing Yun. But by the second half of the 19th century, Japan was already scheming to invade China. In 1894, when civil strife broke out in Korea, the King of Korea asked for help, and the Qing government decided to send troops. But Japan wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to occupy Korea and use it as a springboard to invade China. War was about to break out. Rugo 是打不过的。Ordinary officers, like Chen Jin Ying, were one of the few sober-minded people who existed at that time. The Qing government was not aware of the latent crisis and continued to indulge in extravagant pleasures. To celebrate her 60th birthday, Empress Dowager Su Shi spared no expense in building the Summer Palace, and when funds were insufficient, she even embezzled funds that had been earmarked for the Navy. With the shortage of funds, the Beiyang fleet had to use inferior fuel for the warships and couldn't afford to purchase Western weaponry. On July 25, the 1894 Sino-Japanese War broke out. 北洋水师的将士们清楚地知道这些情况。马江海战惨败的前车之鉴就在眼前。大家全都忧心忡忡。但是一直拿着朝廷俸禄的我们没有退路,只有准备战死。At 12.50 p.m. on September 17th, the Beiyang fleet and the Japanese fleet met head-on in the Dadongo Sea area at the Yalu River estuary. At 3.10 p.m., Ding Yuan, the flagship of the Beiyang fleet, was hit. In this critical situation, Deng Shucheng, captain of cruiser Zhu Yuan, raised the flagship flag and took command. The Japanese warships then began a concentrated attack on Zhu Yuan. After 20 minutes, Zhu Yuan sank, and over a hundred sailors, including Deng Shucheng, were martyred. By 3.30 p.m., the Beiyang fleet only had a few ships in fighting condition. Most ships had quit the battle due to damage and returned to shallow waters to save themselves. The damaged Jing Yuan could do it as well, but the crew chose to continue to fight.
Jing Yuan fought bravely to intercept the main warship of the Japanese fleet, Yoshino, by itself. At 4.48 p.m., the seven-year-old Jing Yuan encountered the newly launched Yoshino. It wasn't a fair battle. Yoshino could fire 102 shells per minute, while Jing Yuan could fire only four shells. 17 minutes later, three more Japanese ships joined the siege. The guns of all four ships were aimed at Jing Yuan.我的儿子还小The Japanese shells poured down like a storm on Jing Yuan. Captain Lin Yong Shang was killed by shrapnel. The first mate, Chen Tua, took over the command and died as well. Then Chen Jing Yin, the second mate, took command. The Japanese kept signaling Jing Yuan to surrender, but not a single man gave up the fight. At 5.30 p.m., Jing Yuan sank. More than 200 officers and men were martyred. Chen Jing Ying was only 32 when he died. If we have a big we have won. Jing Yuan's sacrifice won precious time for the fleet. At 5.45 p.m., the ships of the Beiyang fleet had been repaired and were ready to return to the battle. The Japanese fleet Realizing they couldn't annihilate, the Bay Young fleet retired from the battle. The bravery of Jing Yuan shocked the enemy. A Japanese officer wrote in the log, they never raised the white flag. They just kept fighting and fighting till death. I think they'll have no regrets. There is no home without a country. Only when a country is strong can people have dignity. The reason that the Chinese nation should go through so much hardship and thrive is that there have always been brave and faithful warriors willing to give all they have for the future of the country. <laughs>